Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for your patience. It's always a slight challenge to bring everybody in here, but it's safe to say that the uh, uh, topic of artificial intelligence and the EU's new strategy has drawn uh, quite a bit of attention, not only in the room, but we're also web streaming this. Uh, so I'm very happy to welcome you all, both here in the European Parliament uh, as well as online. Um, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to learn from different exp experts on their views of the new EU strategy, which will be presented by Jua Haikala. And then we will go into uh, short bios of the other speakers and your Q&A. Um, there's so much discussion about artificial intelligence these days. You can't escape it anywhere. Some people expect you know, the robots to take over very soon. Um, there are world leaders that are talking about an arms race and expecting that uh, the country that has supremacy in artificial intelligence will be the new uh, global dominant uh, player, at least if we believe uh, Vladimir Putin. And it's, of course, the question if we should, but perhaps that's one of the, the themes that we can discuss, the notion of scale, the notion of the speed of innovation, and the question of what kind of governance is appropriate to safeguard not only European values, but universal principles, and how machines and people should relate to each other, and what the horizons are before we may even meet tangible questions like this, or whether it's all still uh, more of a philosophical and hypothetical discussion. In any case, um, I think it is very important that in uh, a time where digitization often means privatization, we look very clearly as parliamentarians, as lawmakers, at what it means to preserve the public interest. And preferably not retroactively, not reacting to incidents or even systematic um, failures in uh, the relationship between companies and um, the public interest, but really to proactively embrace setting the frames that preserve this public interest and the well-being of people. Um, we've learned quite a few lessons, uh, I think, in this, uh, in this field about how important principled regulation can be. And what I think is remarkable that when we're discussing artificial intelligence, more than in any other topic that I've ever come across, uh, more than um, uh, in any other area generally, people ask for regulation when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, I hear this from the private sector that's basically saying, yes, we need regulations. I hear this from experts who are saying it is important to set frames within which machine learning can grow and artificial intelligence can be developed. And trust me, we often hear the opposite. We often get uh, big no signs and pushes against regulation, especially when it comes to technology. You've probably all heard the arguments. Regulation will kill the open internet, will stifle innovation, et cetera, et cetera. And here, when it comes to artificial intelligence, we, we hear quite the opposite. So I think that's interesting. I don't know if it's a sign of the concerns that people have also in the private sector and that they would like to uh, be in close touch with, with experts and lawmakers. Maybe it signals something else. Um, I'm here to learn too, but those are the kinds of questions you know, what should this regulation look like? What is the role of Europe? And how can we make the approach that we take values-based uh, that are, are on my mind when I think about artificial intelligence? And so uh, I believe that the European strategy is a good first step, although um, even if uh, every euro of the public that we spend, we should think about critically, uh, the amounts of money are not uh, on the same level as what we see from China, from the private sector, from the United States. We, of course, have the member states that are engaging in some of their own programming. And the question is, how do they relate to the EU overall level and the initiatives by member states? How do we avoid, avoid fragmentation? Um, so while I, I would have liked to see a bit more detail and a, a lot more ambition, I still think it's very good that the EU has a strategy and it's something we can start working with. And I hope that today's discussion will also provide concrete angles and ways in which we can improve our work here in the European Union. 
So without further ado, let me give the floor to Juha to explain to you some of the key points in this EU strategy. Then I'll introduce the experts that are here to respond basically with their first insights to this EU artificial intelligence strategy. And then we will have plenty of time to engage with you with your questions and then answers again from the experts. Thanks again, Juha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Schake. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here to um, give you an overview of the uh, EU strategy uh, on artificial intelligence, its main components and the kinds of reasons why we do it and what it, what it contains. Um, I suppose I don't need to add much to what uh, Ms. Schake said about the uh, importance of artificial intelligence, why it's so uh, prevalent in our societies today and why it's getting even even more uh, significant, why it's becoming ubiquitous gradually, or maybe not even so gradually, but nevertheless, it is there and it is going to be an even bigger part of our lives in the future. <clears throat> it can obviously make a big difference in many ways to our lives by helping us address many problems, be they societal, uh, be they economic, etc. There are many different application areas. I don't want to go into them. Uh, if you want to have a look at it, have a look at the communication. I just mentioned couple, agriculture, health. These are very obvious areas where the benefits could be huge. At the same time, of course, there are lots of concerns about this technology. So people ask us when we, when we deal with artificial intelligence and robotics, you know, is it going to take over? Is it going to be the end of humankind? Is it going to be very dangerous, what are, the, what are the issues, it's going to kill the jobs, etc. There are all these concerns, which are legitimate, of course, sometimes exaggerated, sometimes well-founded, depending on the case. So it is a technology which is clearly very significant. It's going to make a difference, but it's also something that is um, somewhat worrying. Now, there is obviously a lot going on in this field, big investment, this was already mentioned. Uh, the US, Asia, other regions are actually investing in artificial intelligence quite a lot. And for reasons I mentioned, they are doing it also. This is at the heart of the digitization process of our, of our economy, so artificial intelligence really drives, drives the change. Now, why do we then have to deal with this in Europe? Well, precisely for this reason, we see this investment elsewhere, we see this advance elsewhere. We need to stay at the forefront of this technology in Europe. It is important for us to know that we have uh, the expertise, the excellence in this area, because if we have that, we can shape the development and deployment of this technology on our conditions based on our values. Now, you might wonder whether it's not too late, whether it actually makes sense for Europe to, to, to have an initiative on this. There I would say that we in the Commission, we certainly feel that it's not too late. We have many strengths to build on. In Europe we have a strong research in this area. If you think of some of the key um, movers in, let's say, machine learning, a lot of them are European, even if they are maybe not working for European companies or universities, but they were trained in Europe, they come from the European context. And we also have these, of course, these research centres in Europe. We have lots of startups in Europe. That may not be so well known, but we have actually quite a lot of startup activity in places like Berlin, London, Stockholm, etc. So these companies do get created, these kinds of new small companies which typically then spin off from universities. So we have this, of course, sometimes the problem is that these companies get bought up by big players uh, and uh, this is in a way also part of the weakness. I think a sign of European strength is also the fact that a lot of big players, uh, big tech companies are setting up research labs and research centers in Europe. There are many, many examples. In fact, you could actually ask which big company has not set up their lab in Europe. So these are cropping up, have cropped up, and this is in a way actually a sign of strength, although it comes with a weakness, but nevertheless, it is a strength. So we have these strengths. We have also strengths in some areas like what we call embodied artificial intelligence, robotics. Uh, more than a quarter of, of uh, service robots and industrial robots are produced in Europe. They are actually intelligent robots more and more. This is sophisticated robotics, not just simple repetition of, of, um, of movements. And we have, of course, also uh, a lot of public data that we can take advantage of. 
So we have a sort of host of strengths that we can capitalize on. Um, but in our view, we can really only capitalize on these strengths if we have a European approach, a, a, an integrated European uh, AI strategy. So this enables then us to stay at the forefront and shape the technology. And this is why we're doing it. And the strategy that we have outlined composed, is composed of three main dimensions, if you like. So firstly, we would like to strengthen the technological and industrial uh, uh, side of AI, the, the strengths we have, we want to build on them, strengthen them further. Research, innovation, uh, and industrial strength. So we need to build up and, and boost that capacity. We also want to promote uptake because the benefits of this technology will only become clear when we have uh, uptake, when it's adopted by companies in their businesses, in their models and their operations. So that's, if you like, the technological part of it, which is very important. But given these concerns, we think it's very important not to just limit ourselves to this technological side of things, but also to discuss and address the non-technological non aspects of this. So we're talking about preparing ourselves for the changes that are brought about by artificial intelligence. Jobs, that's a very big concern in the minds of people. How many jobs are going to be killed? How many survive? How many jobs are going to change? And I think it's fair to say we don't know the net outcome, but we know that lots of jobs are going to change. Some are going to be lost. Others are going to be created. So we need to deal with this. And we also need an appropriate legal and ethical framework for this, uh, for this technology so that it can be deployed safely, but at the same time allowing innovation to take place and Europe to develop this technology and benefit from it. So these are, if you like, the main dimensions. And of course, we think that it's also important to throw money behind it. So we have now in our plan uh, pledged increase in investment in this area for the industrial and, and, and uh, uh, research side of things. Those, I, I won't go into the figures because those are all in the, in the document, but this is a very important thing. And we also want to then invite member states, the member states on the one hand, and also the private sector to invest in this technology further. Um, and uh, we think that the kinds of things we need on the non-technological side need to be also pushed forward at the same time. So the investment is not enough. So, of course, we are reviewing our legislation. We are, we are looking at it in the light of the advance of this technology to see to what extent it is fit for purpose. But we also, and, and then we take decisions as to whether, it's, whether uh, amendments are needed, whether even new legislation is needed. But then we think that the ethical aspects are also important. There is a demand for it, not just from citizens, but also more generally from companies more and more. And for this purpose, we have also to support this and also to support our work on this, we are setting up an AI alliance. So this will be a very broad-based way of engaging with the stakeholders and civil society, includes industry, academia and civil society, so not just basically the players involved in this. And this AI alliance is steered or will be steered by an expert group. So we issued a call for experts. These, this, the clo that has closed now, we are analyzing the, 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 the applications. We are looking uh, into the kind of right balance, the right kinds of expertise we need uh, for this about 30 strong group, which will steer the alliance. The alliance will be a very broad based consultation of the stakeholders. We'll, we will be starting an online platform which enables then variable constellations to discuss different issues as the need arises. There is a very concrete task that this alliance has, which is to come up with um, ethical guidelines by the end of the year, end of the year, early next year. So we want this alliance steered by the expert group to come up with uh, ethical guidelines for the European uh, Union, for the European Commission. And then further on next year, we want this, this alliance to come up with more recommendations uh, as to how they see the future of AI in Europe. Why this ethics uh, importance is simply there, we think that the European Union could take a lead in this. As I said, there is demand. There is also international discussions about it. There are many initiatives, but few of them, if any, are of significant weight. Uh, or, and we think that maybe as a public operator, we have a role here and we have perhaps sufficient weight 
to become a leader here in this area. So this ethical side, legal side, also very important with concrete actions in the pipeline. I would also like to raise uh, two more points. We also think that it's, it's quite important to democratize AI. So we, we, I mentioned already the take-up. And for this democratization, if you like, in quotes, we, we want to make sure that technology, so its components, algorithms, uh, data, services, advice, is broadly available. Meaning that companies can incorporate this as part of their business models, uh, take it into account in their activities. So we have this idea of an, of an AI on demand platform. This is already something that is, uh, had been prepared um, uh, some time ago, and it is basically starting next year. The idea is, is here to capitalize on the strengths we have, build on what we have. So make what is available in Europe, make that available to have it concentrated in one place, or at least have one place where to go, where to find it. And it comes with this notion of services as well. So this will then enable a better uh, enable better access to this technology. So this is the way of, of get also promoting take-up. And another concept which is important in this concept is the digitizing uh, digital innovation hubs. So we use this notion of digital innovation hubs to refuse this technology. So these are centers uh, surrounded, so competence centers surrounded by other services, expert advice, uh, testing uh, opportunities for companies to go and see how this technology works for them if it does, if it doesn't, and how they can benefit from it. Because there are many companies out there who could benefit from uh, AI, but don't actually know how to use it. So this is very important in our, in our plans. So um, I think I should just basically finish by mentioning one more point, which is the involvement of the member states. So I said this is the European strategy. We think it's extremely important to have the member states aligned and supporting this strategy. And in fact, just uh, over two weeks ago, we had an event here in Brussels where 24 member states plus Norway and others are coming on board. The remaining few are coming on board as well, we hope, um, signed a declaration of cooperation on artificial intelligence where these member states pledged to support our strategy and to also support this by, by uh, taking it into account in their national strategies. So we were very pleased uh, and heartened by this, this reception. Uh, of course, we had talked to them about our plans and, and they, they were well received and we got this strong support. Uh, so this is something very important for us to, to, to have in mind. And of course, then we are going to take concrete steps. By the end of the year, we're going to set up structures as part of the digitizing European industry, existing structures. So we're not creating new structures, but we are uh, utilizing existing um, an existing framework to, to sort of forge a plan with the member states on how to take advantage of this technology. So this is what I want to, to finish with. Just final comment. Technology is not inevitable. It's not going to be just happening. It's not going to be descending on us. We can actually shape the way it's developed and deployed. And this is why we are going about this this way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you are for laying out all the aspects and all the work that went into the EU's strategy. Clearly, there are very many different components, and what we'll try to do now is sort of take off and zoom in uh, on a number of these components with, with uh, key experts, and I'm very, very happy that they have found time and that they are willing to engage in this discussion here this afternoon. We will start with an introduction by André Loosgroek pietri to my left, he will focus on the investment side, why it's needed to invest, what Europe should do, and uh, uh, why disruption is welcomed. Um, then we will go to a private sector perspective by Niklas Lundblad. He is vice president of public policy for Google in Europe. And then we'll hear another company perspective from Stephanie Fink, who is with Salesforce. And last but not least, we will hear the much referenced ethical perspective from Professor Luciano Floridi, who is at the University of Oxford. So I hope that uh, is a good start for your questions and then a discussion. André, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marietje, and good afternoon, everybody. 
So just uh, um, a sign of caution, because it's the early afternoon, the coffee is not that strong. Um, so you need to know that there are a couple of Jedis in this room, and it's not just me. So for those of you who maybe don't want to focus completely, beware, they are among you. Uh, a couple of points before I go into the, the detail, just to react, because that's also the principle of this, of this discussion. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I heard anxiety. I think uh, it's very important for when we hear this, this term AI, it's actually disrupting all the areas. So I'm, I, I must say, and it's a question probably to the Commission, uh, more and more a little bit doubtful about these topics where you put digital or AI in a box, because it's important for us to give the purpose, how it's going to influence our lives, how it's going to influence uh, agriculture, healthcare, and so on. I think this is also a way that we make it less technical, that we make it less uh, elitist, and probably also that we make it less anxiety-filled. Uh, the second thing is we heard about the regulation part. That was your introduction. And, and there was the other word, scale, and the opportunity, because Europe is a massive market that uh, a lot of companies are, are putting the AI center, and because they're attracted by the massive EU market. I think the one thing that brings the two concepts together is the concept of speed is uh, is today uh, those who are the fastest reflecting probably but the fastest to adopt a new technology adapting them to their values some people would say values some people would say regulation will probably determine the world of tomorrow so th the concept of speed seems very important for us and the, the third thing and this is the, the purpose of my three four minutes introduction is, the, is uh, what is the key success factor in this, in this world. We hear a lot about you know, these new technologies and these big platforms coming from China, from the US. Um, disruption is also to our benefit. Too long Europe was in a defensive mode, wanting to tax, and I, I, I admit I'm part French, uh, uh, wanting to tax. Uh, GDPR initially was seen as a defensive tool only today, we just had the discussion with Joao, is seen as a great offensive tool to promote what is important, privacy, which is not just important for, 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 for Europe. And I think the disruption is an opportunity to, to leapfrog and to take the lead again. So that is my presentation about. So just the next slide, please. Uh, what is JEDI? JEDI is, is a new form of public-private partnership. It's basically most of the large research centers, technology firms, and deep tip startups, mostly in France and Germany, but open to Estonians, to Belgium, to Dutch and Italians. So the idea is to build something with those who are willing to go fast and uh, to, to, to lead the way. Uh, next slide. The, the idea, and this is very related to the topic of AI, we were talking about uh, startups, the idea is to finance what will shape tomorrow's technological world, what the US, what the Americans would call the moonshots. Uh, you at Google have a, even a division which is called X, which is, which is doing that. Moonshots are basically areas which have no business case. And where the private sector, even the startups, and even the VCs, I was a VC until last April, are not investing because it's simply too risky. But we all feel that quantum computing, genomics, um, uh, 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 um, space exploration, no business case for it today, but we all feel that it's going to shape what is going to make our world of tomorrow and our jobs of tomorrow. So this is what we want to do, and that's where we see the role of the states and of the EU as so important. So next slide. And it's a test for our democracy. I think those who only see technology as a pure, that you said very rightly, uh, Marietje, uh, it's a test for our democracies. Today, people are using, I lived 10 years in China, a lot of respect for this country, but it's a country that is going to you. It's an Orwellian state. I know it's on record. Bon. Uh, too bad for my visa. Um, but it's already an Orwellian state. I mean, when people ask, does President Xi has, will have one day more power or as much power as Mao Zedong, he has more power than Mao Zedong because, as you know, today and compulsory in 2020, uh, China, China will implement its social scoring. We're ready today. More than four million people have been banned from taking a train because they have a score which make the authorities feel that they could be too dangerous. Remember Minority Report? It's not the future, it's happening today. So that's why it's so important that we lead in technology because otherwise other people will push them upon us. Next slide, please. 
And the reality check. I want to be optimistic, but uh, that's also maybe a way to get you a little bit excited this afternoon. Uh, the, the theme is excited, but I suppose you were annoyed like I was by this title of The Economist, the, the battle for digital supremacy. Europe is not appearing neither on the cover page nor on, this, on the full um, uh, document. We seem to be sidelined. This is something. Ten largest companies in the world, eight, China, eight American, two Chinese, more worryingly, seven tech companies. So technology is going to shape the future growth and job. Next slide. So uh, very uh, unmodestly, uh, we, we brought some kind of uh, uh, an awakening here. Uh, we, we, we came together last August. Um, we led to the fact that President Macron announced an agency for disruptive innovation. The Germans have backed the idea just last week, and we are happy to see that the EU Commission, that initially was very much focused on scaling up companies, is now also seeing disruptive innovation as a massive, important uh, topic for the future EIC. Next slide. Um, the idea is simple, is to have a body that is agile, that is not the typical bureaucracy, which is able in a couple of days or in a couple of weeks to put big bets, 15 million, 20 million, 25 million, without a business case, but on areas where we feel they are going to be key for the future. Uh, and here, that might be a slight difference, or maybe that's the way you want to sh shape your expert group, you are. We need to be very careful of experts groups, even if here we have a room full of experts, because you are not disrupting anything with experts. There's this famous tunnel effect. So to give you an example, we have science fiction writers on our board, because we think it's important that we think massively out of the box. Just think, we put so much billions in Europe in the space industry, I have huge respect. I myself have worked in aerospace for a long time. We completely I don't want to use a bad word. We completely, completely failed in seeing renewable rockets happening. And then I hear since a couple of weeks, uh, the Europeans, the French, the Germans are saying, now we need to do renewable rockets. That's already, the, that's again the thing of the past. We need to invest the next big thing. And that's where also AI can play a massive role. And I'm finished on the areas that we, next slide, uh, where we will, um, yeah, next one. Where we will focus, uh, next slide please. Uh, this, just to give you some very concrete, because I think actually the themes is very important. Today we speak a lot about firewalls, we think, think, uh, think a lot about antiviruses. I think the future for digital systems will be AI that will auto-protect digital system. You probably saw the scandal in Germany where for 300 days the, the government was hacked. The fact to be hacked will be probably as common in the future as, be, as having a flu, but that for 300 days the Ministry of Defense of Interior and other ministries did not know that somebody was in the system. That is something, and that's probably where AI can identify. We also, we also think that big data, and I say that very publicly, is probably a weapon of mass destruction of the, la of the, of the big platforms. We all think that big data is an objective concept. Why do you need three million, five million pictures to recognize a cat or a car, which is today's business model of most of the... Probably the future will be to teach robots cars like a kid. A kid does not need. So the concept of small data, that's probably something which the Europeans need to research massively. This is completely a technological frontier, but that will probably also be much more close to our own values, not to have massive data lakes. What means data lakes is capacity of. And, um, and uh, look at what's going on right now in our public spaces. I mean, obviously, the tendency with the current uh, security con uh, uh, situation is to put cameras everywhere. What can we do in our airports? How can we develop a way that is not the Chinese way? 400 million cameras. 400 million cameras in China, just to give you a sense. Uh, that is all interconnected to one big database. I don't think we want that. I think we want another way. And there's probably a massive business sector industry to create of it. So the, the, the jobs of the future will probably not come by protecting the existing ones, but really proactively uh, to invest in areas that, uh, that are close to our values, that give a purpose, but that are truly disruptive. And uh, for that, we probably need a new way. And this is what I conclude on. Thank you very much. I hope I respected the time. You can follow us on Twitter, by the way. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, now, Nicholas, I would like to ask you to share a few thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so, I don't have slides, uh, but I will, I will give a few comments on, on first where we come from and then on the strategy, which I think is a really interesting piece of work, and thank you for the presentation. Um, for us as Google, AI is sort of at the heart of what we do, and it's always been that way, because if you're dealing with vast amounts of information, and you're trying to figure out how to allocate attention over that information, you need to build different kinds of technologies. And whether or not we call them AI, those technologies have similarities and they have certain traits that, that help augment human intelligence. This is something that was observed by Herbert Simon back in 1969. He said famously that with a wealth of information, comes a poverty of attention and a need to allocate attention efficiently. And back in 69, Simon actually also made the observation that the only way we will do this is by investment in artificial intelligence. And so the trend we're in now is not a new one, it's one that's been inherent in the field of artificial intelligence, a young field, it was you know, coined only in 1956, for quite some time. And if, if your mission is, as ours grandiosely is described, to organize all the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful, there's no way you can do that without understanding, working with, and developing artificial intelligence. It's important to remember a couple of things around artificial intelligence though, when we discuss this. And I think that, that I'd like to bring it back a little bit from, from the futuristic perspective. For the essence of artificial intelligence is to be a complement and not a substitute of human intelligence. Um, what, what we see emerging here and what we should applaud and, and encourage is, is a kind of synthetic intelligence where we combine the computational power of machines, they do things they're really good at, like classifying or categorizing, with the amazing capacity of the human brain. In a sense, artificial intelligence is actually a chance for us to rediscover the power of the human mind, find where we can complement it, and make us all better off, off in the between. So it's important not to focus only on the technology, but to, to bring in, I think, the human element into this as well. And this, is, this goes back to why. The, the telos, the reason that we're doing this. And I think one of the, one of the reasons we're interested in artificial intelligence is that, that we are facing as a society more complex situations, more complex problems, you know, economic, social, scientific problems, and we need to learn in a better way. We need to act in a more responsible way. And learning is what we can do with this new synthetic intelligence where you bring artificial intelligence and the human mind to bear on, on the kinds of challenges that we have. So in view of that, I'd like to offer a few points on the strategy. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'm more than happy to answer questions on other parts of the strategy, but I'd like to, to dig into three things. And the first is, is the need for a multi-stakeholder approach, which I think is clear and articulated in the strategy. And I, I, would, I would really echo that. And I would say it not only in the way that you need to have technology companies and, and lawmakers, you, you need to have the different sectors in there. Because the reality is that it is in the application of these new technologies in specific sectors that will start to understand where the real benefits lie. Artificial intelligence in, in, say, the health sector, where you can use it to detect breast cancer at a much higher accuracy rate than before. And artificial intelligence in the agriculture sector, where we have a, a Japanese farmer who's now an expert at detecting good cucumbers. Is, those are different. They raise different issues. They force us to think differently about those applications. As I, I think it's, it's important that as we do this, we bring those sectors in and treat them inclusively. because. If you, if you look at the technological innovation of artificial intelligence, it is in itself great. But what carries greater promise in a sense, I think, and, and that's important, is the organizational innovation that comes after. And that's what we should be focusing on. The technological innovation in itself is fantastic, and we should, of course, have a mind to that. But what it allows us to do is to reorganize our business models, the, the provision of public services, our research, in many different ways. And I think that that's where a lot of the, the productive growth, a lot of the, the, uh, the human values of the technology will be uncovered. Now, so for me, that multi-stakeholder approach is a way to address the power of organizational innovation inherent in, in technology. I think that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. I think the, the strategy is there, but I think that's one of the things I'd like to articulate. 
The second thing that the strategy is, is, is spot on about is, I think, this need for a deeper ethical understanding, principles, dialogue around this. And, then, and it, it, as argued in, in the strategy, this is a key part. And I, I think it's a key part for, for a lot of technology. As one of my, you know, if you can have favorite German philosophers, I have one. Uh, one of my favorite German philosophers is Hans Jonas. Um, and, and he noted in a, in a beautiful little essay that all use of technology is the exercise of power which is quite right. All the use of technology is the exercise of power. So that means that it, sh it cannot help but be the object of, of ethical exploration. This is not unique for artificial intelligence, but applications of this technology of machine learning and similar technologies across a wide range of fields will encourage us to understand the ethical spaces and issues that we face here in a much deeper fashion. I, Jonah's point is, is, however, sometimes lost. He says it's the use of technology not technology itself. And as we dig in to the ethical principles, let's talk not about the ethics of artificial intelligence, but the ethics of the use of artificial intelligence. It may seem like sophistry, but there's a, there's a point in that nuance that I think is, is quite important. Ethics ultimately is not about, you know, it's, it's not about technological means, but about human action and what we can do with technology. So as we dig into this, I think there's a lot to be learned around applications. Again, coming back to how the technology is used. The, the strategy also uh, spends quite some time, and we've spent quite some time here today, to think about Europe's role, identity, self-image when it comes to this field. And, and it, it, it does articulate the European view really well. Um, I think there is plenty to be proud of in Europe. The investments that we are doing, other companies are doing, show very clearly that there's a lot of expertise, there's a lot of deep research, deep thinking about artificial intelligence. And even if we invest in companies, and, and uh, I think some of you know, that is actually quite positive, they don't necessarily want to move over to Silicon Valley. They find that it is quite important for them to remain on European soil because there is such a lot of really good work happening here. There are great communities in Berlin, Paris, other places where, where uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, Learning, the whole field of computer science is being developed at a very fast pace. That said, I think it's also important to think about the global nature of technology. If we frame this as a, as a competition between the US and Europe and China, there's something that is lost, I think. I mean, to my mind, it makes more sense to think about a transatlantic link, a transatlantic market, a transatlantic collaboration around this, and, and perhaps even a global collaboration around this. And I think it needs to be value-driven, and that's where Europe finds its, its center of gravity, its, its key contribution. I think that's exactly right. But when you think about this, let's not lose sight of another thing, too, and that is that we talk about the leaders of the field, we talk about the US, China, and Europe, but this has an enormous potential to improve life in other regions. What about Africa? What about Asia? How do we think about the use of this technology around the world and the benefits it can bring? That's, that would be consonant with a European view of our own responsibility and role to think about what we could actually do in order to encourage the use of these technologies in regions that don't necessarily need, that, that might otherwise not get access to them as fast as, as they would do today. So I think that's really important. And I think that maybe the, the, the focus on competition and development could do well with a little bit of thinking around collaboration across those different borders. Finally, I'd just like to congratulate the Commission on its work here. I think it's, it's really important. I think that we are happy as a company to contribute to this, and I think it's something that we, we um, uh, look forward to doing. Um, it, it shows a clear way forward. It forms a basis and a good foundation for discussion, and, and we're looking forward to figure out how we, where, where we can, where we can uh, dock it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have one follow-up question, but I'll wait until the others um, speak. So, Stephanie, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation uh, to speak here. Um, let me just start by saying just two words about Salesforce and what we do to just clarify. Uh, what's our angle? So, basically, we're a cloud computing company. We're a cloud pioneer. And we're in the software business. So our um, vision of AI is actually how do you make software more intelligent? How can you improve software to actually augment human capacity? So um, that's really our vision of AI. And, and, and basically, we're in the business now of bringing AI to uh, the companies. Uh, we're a B2B company. We've always developed software for the past 19 years, um, already in the cloud. 
and now embedding AI um, in all the products we have. So it's not a standalone thing where you can imagine. So we're away from the robots or anything. I think we, we all agree on that. But here's really um, for each of the product we develop, how do you um, upgrade them? How do you augment everything that has been possible and to bring it to the companies with the, the, the big companies or the small ones? And so what does it mean? It's um, data analytics, it's insights, it's analysis, it's prediction. Um, and just to give you an example, um, because we always, it always resonates better when we're concrete, but we're working with a Finnish company uh, called Kone. They are in the elevator business. And uh, it's a very traditional business. And they now use a combination of AI from actually Salesforce and IBM to, on the one hand, read the equipment's condition. So basically, you have a software that would read what's the condition of the elevator um, or the rolling stairs. And then they send information automatically to the teams, the operational teams on the ground, every time they believe there is a potential issue. So basically, it's making that information flow faster and avoid potential issues. Are we talking about food automation? No. We're just analyzing quick information and sharing it. But then there is a human decision whether or not to intervene, whether or not there is really a risk, and whether we need to check. So, so that's really about the, the definition or the way we see augmenting human capacity. Um, not briefly on the, on, on the strategy, I mean, it's a welcome initiative. I think there is no debate here, as you said, on why we need to do it. Um, Europe um, has a role to play, and uh, it's welcome that Europe wants to seize that opportunity. Um, the way we see it, we see a leadership for Europe, but also a role to uh, present a harmonized vision um, of how AI could be leveraged here in Europe. I think. Um, we're in the cloud computing business, so we don't think with borders. We deal with them because they exist. But when we think, we don't think about a fragmented world. And um, I think that's one of our uh, comments here is um, we welcome the unified approach. We welcome initiatives by member states. But anything that can make the single market uh, stronger and embrace AI as a whole um, is very important. Um, and to add to that, I mean, for instance, just a free flow of data. It's one thing we mentioned. Um, it's being um, discussed and taken care of here, but that's just a cornerstone. We, it's just to, to re-mention and re-emphasize this here. Um, quickly on the investment in R&D, I think André uh, covered it perfectly. Um, it, it's totally necessary, and I think the one point I'll stress, I really liked your comment around experimenting, testing, and maybe developing that fail mentality here in Europe. We're always asked as an American company, what's the difference, what do you have there? But one of the things is the mentality. You can test, you can fail, you start again. So um, any flexibility around that. And I uh, just wanted to mention um, the, the, the inclusion of regulatory sandbox. That's an example. We're going to talk quickly about the legal framework. We're just having the room to innovate uh, in a lighter regulatory environment is, is very welcome. Um, another thing is uh, we're all about demystifying AI and what it means uh, and what we can do with it. So, Let's talk about the opportunities and let's bring it to the companies. Um, I think I've seen in the communication that only 10% of SMEs actually do data analytics. 10% um, is really not a lot. And that also explains why we have a difficulty to grasp it. So the question is, how do we bring it to the companies? I think one of the response from the commission is the AI on demand platform. So happy to discuss how that, how that will work in, in practice and, and how we can leverage that. Um, and in terms of the take up of AI and really democratizing it, um, I just wanted to stress on two aspects. So the first one uh, being trust and around the legal framework and ethics, and the second one on skills. Um, trust, yes. I mean, we would be out of business if we couldn't have the trust of our customers. Um, and that's the same question with AI. AI is not going to take up if um, the citizens, the users cannot trust the technology. So we need a robust legal framework, um, but when we look at it, so we appreciate the, the initiative from the Commission to look at what's existing, what can be leveraged, and really identify areas where action is needed. Um, we all know that now the GDPR um, is coming into force in a few days. Uh, it's setting a standard. It does already have an article that provides protection against uh, autom automized and semi-automized um, data processing. Um, 
So that's already actually a great step when you when you think about the discussion we're having here. We already have a provision that can be used. Um, there is a data package that has been presented. So there is reuse uh, of public sector information. Again, data is key here. So we need access to data to be able to do analytics. Um, so these are all very welcome initiatives. And um, I think what we, we want, um, and also speaking for smaller companies, is really let's see what we can do within that framework. It will create trust. And then within that framework that is very robust, see where there is room for flexibility and, and for innovation. Um, coming to the point around ethics, um, yes, so the, the purpose of AI is to make the human being smarter um, and not to include more bias. And you can have many interesting discussion around what is bias in AI. And I um, totally agree with uh, uh, Nicholas. The bias is very often the human. Algorithm by default are not biased. Technology isn't biased. It's what we do with it and it's the data we have. And so here, my point will be around, how do you eliminate it? I mean, AI can also be a catalyst and uh, reveal bias in the way we look at things. Um, and here, our, um, our pledge will be to actually be, develop a more diverse um, workforce and research uh, force, if I can say that. Um, we, we believe um, in equality. We want a more diverse workplace. Um, tech has more to do in that respect, but I think it's the society as a whole. And if we have the same group of people working on the, the algorithm, gathering the data, defining the rules, um, we, we will maintain and further develop that bias. So I think it's really taking a holistic view at that and, and just also learning from what AI tells us. It just, it just amplifies some, some of the, the flaws that we see and we need to get smarter in learning from that. Um, now the, ver the very last point is around skills. Um, it's, uh, it's actually one that hasn't been mentioned too much so far. And, and it's key. Uh, we are developing technology at a very fast pace, um, but we need, if we want it to be used and embraced, we need to develop the skills. So on the one end, we're talking about education, basic, ground level, but we also, and as AI is, of course it's disruptive. It's gonna change how the, um, the, the, the job market is going to look like. Some functions will be needed, some others won't be needed anymore. So on a, in addition to um, education, we also need reskilling opportunities. Um, and in that sense, we welcome uh, the, the emphasis on the lifelong learning in the communication. Um, private sector also has a role to play there. Um, we've developed our own platform that is called Trailhead to deliver online trainings, to build coding, uh, or AI skills. We just realized that there is, we need to find a more flexible way for whoever to get uh, trained and smarter on, on the technology. Um, I'm gonna pause here and also say that we, I think the industry understands there is a room for us to work together here and play a role. So welcome to the discussion as well. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, <laughs> Professor Floridi. Then there's a lot of food for discussion, so I'm already looking forward to that. Please go ahead. Well, th thank you for the invitation. And uh, um, while I was listening, uh, uh, I thought about the, the famous sentence, uh, which I'm going to rephrase, I'm from the university and I'm here to help. <laughs> As you know, uh, uh, that is always very scary. Um, so I could also rephrase that in terms of I'm an expert and I'm here to help. Again, very scary. Uh, experts don't get good publicity these days. Um, now, let me just uh, move straight to the ethical perspective of this. We heard about uh, this uh, uh, several times and uh, with uh, very interesting insights. So my contribution will be to provide uh, just about five suggestions, uh, they're just suggestions, of what we could or perhaps should do with AI as we develop it in Europe. And then uh, a couple of comments on what kind of ethics are we talking about here? And, and by the way, um, not that I want to offend anyone, but a good test to know whether people know what they're talking about is to see whether they use ethics as a singular or plural. Uh, mind anyone who says ethics are, that's, uh, that's a bad sign of not knowing what they're talking about. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, and we start going. So we know this is not a problem, and I won't spend any time on this. Uh, the big bad robot is not coming. Uh, uh, keep in uh, uh, California, especially at, in Hollywood, what belongs to Hollywood. Um, but the five um, comments uh, are this. First of all, 
let's make AI environmentally friendly. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this is a very European way of looking at uh, uh, augmented intelligence, the sort of complementarity that uh, Nicholas was mentioning about. Uh, next slide. Um, what I mean by this is that uh, this is the most recent de uh, data that I could find. I'm sure they could be updated. But essentially, the bottom is the cost of, generally speaking, digital technologies. And the top, the light green, is how much digital technologies are helping us in terms of global footprint. As you can tell, I hope you never had the experience. I did twice. If you see someone cured for cancer, what you're trying to do is to make sure that you kill the cancer before you kill the patient. That's how much the patient suffers. That's what we're doing to our planet. We're trying to get the light green faster there than the dark green. AI can be of immense value in fastening uh, that progress. Next slide. Well, let's make it human friendly. Not as a second, but no, as an equally important goal. Uh, by this, I mean a variety of things, one of which is next slide, for example, uh, is to handle the complexity of our systems. We know that we're going to live in increasingly complex uh, environments, huge, humongous cities, not all of them very smart, uh, only some of them. Uh, given that the population of this planet will be living in urban conditions more and more so, who and how are we going to handle this degree of complexity, if not by AI? One of the greatest things we have invented, anyway. So, once again, uh, human-friendly is the key word here. It's ethics, is what we ought to do. Next. Makes your PD work for intelligence. That's a bit of a catchphrase, uh, and I uh, actually am on the same page as the previous speakers. Of course, it's a matter of collaboration. But let me just uh, make this point uh, a bit lighter with the next slide. Uh, this is what I want for my birthday. Uh, I don't think we should use a human brain to cut grass. Think for a moment. We've got robots on Mars, and yet every Sunday during the summer, you go there and cut the grass with a human brain. That is, shall we say, a waste of resources, to say the least. Now, why this is important? Because um, AI can actually raise the threshold of what is economically feasible. It doesn't replace the person that cuts the grass. It enables the person who cuts the grass to take care of the roses. That is what's going to happen. In that sense, you no, know, it will help intelligence to do something more, something better, more worthy of our own status. Next. There's a typo there which I forgot to uh, correct. But make the predictability uh, that is uh, enabled by AI work for our ability to determine our own actions. Now, this uh, important distinction, which I will close this uh, little uh, speech with, between uh, feasibility and preferability. Something is feasible, but it doesn't mean you prefer to do that. Now, in this case, it's perfectly feasible to predict which toothpaste I'll come back home from the supermarket. I'm a very rational human being. I always buy the same toothpaste. Uh, do I want to be uh, nudged, manipulated, predicted because of my toothpaste? And I'm being kind. Uh, I am not mentioning, I'm not mentioning Cambridge Analytica. Uh, e well, uh, not really. Uh, I wouldn't like to do that, although it's perfectly feasible. So make sure that that is not going to happen or it's going to happen in the right way. Next. This is what we want to avoid, as an example. Oh, by the way, if you can't see the date, it's 2013. It's been a while since we have been, shall we say, daring to use these technologies in a way that is crossing boundaries that maybe are not so smart. Philadelphia calls begin to use the computer forecast to predict future criminal behavior. Well, there is no minority report, as we heard before. Next, point number five. Let's make technology make us more human. It may sound a bit philosophical. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm from the university. I'm here to help. But to be a little bit more concrete next, uh, uh, let's uh, consider this. Now, we consider ourselves today our philosophical anthropology, although we don't call it that way, and of course you don't find that on the Daily Mail. Um, well, we consider ourselves informational organisms. At the end of the day, that's how the legislation des describes us, data subjects. Well, that should tell us something about our anthropology, shouldn't it? Well, if we are informational organisms, not only, not just, I cracked this joke before, so forgive me if I crack it before, but uh, just a few years ago, uh, when I was younger, I was told that I was uh, essentially mostly water, uh, and pretty much that's it. Uh, 
So if you are essentially not very different from a jar of Nescafe, uh, uh, the only difference is that little jar and 80 litres of water, just add water and here you go. Well, that was a chemical view that we don't adopt today. We look at ourselves differently in terms of information, organisms, data subjects, etc. Well then, next slide, from that perspective, our lives and identities are really fragile. Modernity has been built on the robustness of human nature. We need to write the second chapter. Chapter one is great, but chapter two also highlights how malleable, fragile, undetermined, indecisive. Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, remember next, this next time you go to the restaurant, you're not quite sure what to eat. Well, in this case, then, next slide, we should really make sure that the AI we're building, because it's a huge reservoir of agency, incredibly powerful there, is built in a way that is respectful and support what we are. Now, uh, nature's beautiful glitch. And if you are religious, you think that there's a plan. If you're not, that you think is a bug. Either way, is special. Okay? So I'm happy to stop at the special, whichever the, you know, the divide you want to be on. Uh, now, in that sense, remember, AI is the drop falling on the stone. We think we're strong because we are the stone. Drop and drop and drop will be shaped by their agency, if you're not careful. So don't be mistaken. Just because you feel that we are all stones and robust, that drop will carve us uh, if we're not careful. And I'm not being pessimistic. I'm just saying, well, let's make sure that we do the right thing. Next, we're getting close to the end. Now, this is normally what you find in a sort of little lecture on uh, ethics, regulations, and governance. Ethics uh, influences governance and regulations. Regulations, together with ethics, uh, influence governance. What drives the whole mechanism is ethics, namely values. But what exactly, what ethics? Next slide. Well, uh, next again. Um, you want to uh, work, of course, with the feasible. That's what good companies do. No, 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 sort of the impossible remains impossible. But within that, next, and we'll just drop the whole thing. Next, then stop. Before, that's it. Uh, well, here, um, of course, we want to be sustainable, see the green uh, ecology before. But within that, are we aiming for what is socially acceptable or even perhaps preferable? Well, that is something that we need to hear from the people. And uh, allow me to be a little bit more friendly towards our American colleagues. We, the people, okay? That is where we want to understand what is socially preferable. And to conclude, uh, well, next slide. This is the kind of space that uh, I think the GDPR, uh, the uh, strategy for AI is working with. Through time, as you can tell on the left-hand side, we have a feasibility, what technology allows us to do, which is constrained by human rights, because we are in Europe, and by compliance, because we don't joke about law. But between compliance and human rights, there's an empty space, which is to play well according to the rules. No one ever questions that the rules are there to play according to. But how well you play according to the rules? Well, that is called ethics. And playing well according to the rules it's exactly where companies will do the right thing, where uh, governments will do the right thing or not. Now, in that context, uh, the last two bits, please. Um, we should really not look at ethics as a constraint, as don't do this, don't that, uh, don't run with Caesars kind of moment. Uh, now, that's too simple. I mean, ethics really has a dual advantage, next and last. Sorry, that's it. Uh, almost there with the human interaction. Uh, it's a risk management. Yes, it is. Uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica are there to remind us. Uh, and I have to say, never been such a good business for a university professor uh, since that disaster. Um, but also an opportunity strategy. It's the strategy of making sure that the things that you can do with AI as a society are actually doable. No one single-handedly could do it. But we, the people, plus we, the people, and our technologies, we can be more ambitious and lowering opportunity cost. Things that we cannot do or we will not do if we are single, not a society, without technology. Single, empty-handed. You're not going to go very far. And whatever you don't do, that, for the former Catholic in me, is also a sin. You know, remember, maybe some of you, you know, all those sins in uh, thoughts and also omissions. Well, opportunity strategy is there to make sure that our omissions will not be uh, too high. And that's really the last slide. Thank you so much.
thank you very much. Uh, I think this gives a, a very multidimensional perspective on the whole question of artificial intelligence. Uh, I wanted to ask an initial follow-up question and then happy to open it up. Uh, I was very triggered, Nicholas, by what you said about uh, AI being at the heart of everything that, uh, that Google does, and at the same time noting that a lot depends on how it's applied. Uh, but then, maybe because of the time, you didn't go into how Google applies AI, and I think that that's really, really important. I heard a lot about opportunities, but can you give a few concrete examples of how the company applies it now? I'm happy to. Thank you for the question. So there, there are several different areas where we apply AI, and I think there are, uh, let me give three examples. The first is translation. Translation is something we used to do by simple pattern matching, but if you watch the translation services uh, lately, you will see that they've improved greatly because they're now using other newer technologies in order to come up with greater translations. And, and those translations also, they're not just text to text, they're actually speech, they're um, you can even look at and, and uh, subtexts and closed caption uh, videos with this kind of technology now. And so, so that's, that's one of the different ways in which we're applying it. The second is that if you look at search as a problem at the, the, the very heart of what we do, uh, it, is a, it is an unsolved problem and we're putting all of our machine learning to work for search. Search is interesting and in order to understand the problem, I think it's important to remember that the amount of information doubles every 12 months. Mm -hmm which means that if you do nothing as a search engine and you believe there's some kind of linear relationship between the amount of information and the quality of the, the responses, you realize that you get half as good in a year. So we do literally tens of thousands of experiments and implement thousands of them every year in order to improve the results in search. And that is mostly machine learning at the very heart of the product we have in order to stay at the quality we're at. It's, it's addressing one of the, the core problems in information science, which is a, the red queen problem. It takes all of your running to remain in the very same place. Mm -hmm. and, and then I would say that the, the third example of this is, and it's another example of a recent new product is, is uh, Google Photos, where we're now helping people to group different photos according to you know, themes, you know, according to you know, the finding the cats, as was mentioned earlier, finding, finding different geographies, and, and, uh, and, and that is another way to, to use machine learning. But, but those are our Google core services. If you allow me, I'd also like to talk a little bit about something else that we're doing, that is that we're working together with partners to use AI in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have found is that you can, by looking at the human retina, um, identify uh, the risk for or the likelihood that you have diabetes. So uh, by looking at patterns and looking at data in the human retina, you're actually able to do a non-invasive diabetes uh, uh, examination. It's something that is, is quite significant, not necessarily because of the Western world, but we come back to what we said before. If you can get the cost of these cameras down, you can come to a situation where you could apply this, this method of, of, of making a diagnosis to, to parts of the world where they would never get it otherwise. And so we're working together with medical providers and, and healthcare specialists to figure out how to do that. And that's, that's perhaps the, that's where it gets exciting, where you take it out of our, <laughs> we think it's exciting in our core product, but you take it out of that and you start looking at the crossover and the application of, of something like uh, retina uh, analysis for finding diabetes and possibly even other so uh, other uh, medical conditions. If you can detect other medical uh, conditions without, without the invasiveness of, of an entire healthcare investigation, and you can deploy this broadly, just imagine what an order of magnitude difference that would do to, to healthcare. Not only in the Western world, mm -hmm. but elsewhere. So that's, th those are two examples, or a couple Thank of Thank you, that's helpful, I think, to just give it a bit more context. And then I have another question that I'm really stuck with. I want to ask the other panelists to reflect briefly. Uh, I hope it's of broad relevance. And that's this question of bias. It always comes up in every discussion about AI. And then oftentimes the answer is, as we've also heard a bit today, that it's not the AI, but the people or the data that go in previously that caused the bias. And it really reminds me uh, a bit of uh, how we've been having discussions with some of the best-known tech platforms for a long time. 
uh, or tech companies that have said technology is neutral, we're only a platform, you know, uh, if people want to use the platform to say something negative, uh, you know, they can or say something positive. And it really kind of takes a step back from sort of responsibility, uh, governance choices, etc. And so I would like a bit of reflection on these broader questions about, you know, whose bias are we talking about? Examples have been mentioned about more authoritarian uh, countries versus more open societies. So, you know, who decides uh, what is what is biased and what is non-biased on the basis of which rules, which laws, which which profit models, and how do we how do we look for oversight, uh, oversight of algorithms, questions about liability. Uh, if machines start to make more and more decisions. I mean, who has discriminated? Was it the data set taken from, an, from a quote-unquote average of which country? And then does that make it okay that the outcome is racist or not? I mean, and, you know, I think that these are such important questions. Just because there's bias in everything doesn't mean we should continue to uh, let it sort of uh, accelerate uh, through machine, machine learning, uh, I believe. And... Um, okay, maybe, the, uh, I don't know if this is a separate question, but it's another thing I got stuck with uh, in my head in listening is between the notion of don't watch too many movies, uh, you know, when people are concerned about AI. I heard um, Eric Schmidt saying in, at the Munich Security Conference, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, ideas that are out there will only be with us in 20, 30 years. I mean, take it easy, don't worry now. On the other hand, at the same Munich Security Conference, you have respected... NGOs in the field of human rights warning for f the, the key message was warning against fully automated killer robots from Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, not the least of organizations. So I can't bring these two together. And so maybe this is a bit much to, to start the discussion with, but I would like a few reflections from maybe the other three speakers and then uh, I'll take your questions. Anyone who would like to start? Maybe Professor Floridi, can I ask you? Um, I, I didn't want to volunteer, uh, but um, uh, no, in terms of uh, no, self-conscious, self, self so uh, the philosopher speaks too much. Uh, two comments on the bias. Uh, one, uh, we're talking about negative bias, because there's such thing as positive bias. If you buy an insurance and you are a woman, you pay less than if you buy an insurance and, and you are a teenager male. Uh, we know that. That's why my wife owns the car. Uh, and um, so there's negative bias, uh, and that's what we are worried about. But why are we worried about it? And that's the second point. Well, because uh, sometimes our systems, what they do is simply they throw at, back at us the bias that was almost invisible there. Now, let me remind you this. Imagine, that's the analogy that we need to work with. Imagine two parallel lines that they look parallel completely. But actually, one of them is just a little tiny skewed, just a tiny little bit. And then fast forward billions and billions of miles and they touch each other. Oh, you can see that there was a bit of a skew in one of the lines. That's what a computer can do for you, for us. You can actually run an AI system to show that in that database, although it was almost invisible, there was that skew element there. It's just that we couldn't run like, a million experiments, a million years of no, actions and so on. So let me just reverse for a moment. Actually, AI could help us as an experiment to show where we have bias and rectify. So what's the solution here? Control. The problem with negative bias is when you have negative bias and hands up, say, the computer says so. Well, that is the problem. If negative bias comes with, at the end of the day, someone after the loop saying, okay, that's fine, or no, no, actually, we're not quite sure, let's do that again, well, then I would be a little bit more uh, relaxed. The problem is when you say, well, let's delegate the machine. So negative bias plus the delegation, that seems to me the problem. Thank you. And I'll ask for a few comments from you and then open it up. Thank you. So um, on bias, basically, um, this is one of the things we want to, to look into. I mean, we actually have a... Uh, project starting on algorithmic awareness and um, and uh, this is certainly something that we think is important because we one of the things that we I think state in the in the communication we want to develop AI in a manner which humans can understand and um, and in that sense it's important to, to, to look at look into it it's also on the agenda 
or we will put it on the agenda of the Alliance so that when the ethical issues are, are debated uh, in the EU uh, uh, AI Alliance, we will certainly be uh, discussing this issue um, uh, um, as part of the package, part of the ethical package. It's definitely very important. It's one of the concerns that crops up every now and then. And, I mean, it's not my role here to, to go into the technical details, and, 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 and I'm not equipped to do so either, but, but certainly we think it's very important because we have examples of, of that, as, we're already, uh, as was already pointed out. Um, of course, this then leads to other questions, uh, um, ethical questions, and then this is part of the legal framework package as well, liability, uh, but it's not directly related perhaps, but it's, it's one of the important things that we also then obviously want to discuss. Uh, and there may be liability implications from, from bias as well, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, it comes then obviously in many other ways from applying, uh, deploying this technology in, in, in different fields, uh, deciding then who is liable for what and on what conditions when these systems, particularly when they are self-learning and become more autonomous, uh, this is an important aspect. Indeed, I think that is going to be a key, also regulatory question at some point. Okay, I've talked way too much already. Let me look around the room. I'm sure there's plenty of questions. So I think we'll collect a number at least and then see when it's too much for the panelists to remember and we'll get back to them. Can I see hands? And it would be really nice if you can introduce yourself, use the microphone for the web stream. Please, go ahead. Um, thank you very much um, for organizing this very interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Razvan Temir. I'm from the um, European Brands Association in, um, in Brussels. So our members are consumer goods uh, manufacturers, um, large and, and um, small. Uh, maybe just um, a comment, half question. Um, we had a lot of experiences in the past um, of, of um, basically policy having a lot of trouble and enforcement especially having a lot of trouble to catch up with um, with technology so very recently I think it was last year um, at the consumer and competition day in, in Malta that um, e even DG competition was was explaining that it's no longer possible to just wait for companies to, to hand over data and, and open up algorithms and whatever to, to be able to enforce um, the rules. So this is something where we need to, to maybe think about how, how the, um, the approach is. Maybe one comment on, because our members produce consumer goods, um, so consumer goods means the the very uh, complex goods as well, so the uh, automatic smart lawnmower uh, as well. Um, but there also will be a simple version of that. So it's it's very um, in the past in European Commission we had um, a lot of discussions about the optimal economical choice for the for the consumers, and it's always very difficult to frame it that way. So if that lawnmower is two thousand euros. Uh, it might not be for everyone, so it's 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 a place where you need to encourage choice rather than to impose choice uh, for the for the sake of policy. Um, and and finally, um, our members, um, we we are happy to see that are introducing research and in artificial intelligence and algorithms in in the different stages of the process. You have the back end of the business, the business side, because these are huge companies. Then you have development, then you have the retail side of it, um, and then you have the servicing. On the retail side, to, to give an example, we were seeing studies where consumers basically, from uh, a few years ago, they were um, quitting shops and, and products because you couldn't offer payments integrated in the same platform. Today, they expect you to um, to have everything for them, so they, they don't even want to search for products anymore. Um, you're, you're expected to know everything. So these are some observations, and we're just wondering how that fits with, with um, you know, the Commission coming out with, with initiatives and the Parliament and whatever, and usually that's, that's always a very complex uh, process. Thank um, you. I'm going to try to encourage people to be a bit more brief, uh, because Sorry. otherwise it's going to be a challenge. Uh, but thank you for uh, sharing those observations. Any questions? And if you need to come from the back, find someone with a microphone uh, in the front row. It's going to be exciting, like chair dancing. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a trainee for you, Yarira, and so my question is going to be about copyright. Um, so I know very little technologically about how artificial intelligence is developed, but I know that text and data mining is um, an important factor. And um, within the copyright proposal, from what I understand, there's going to be a limitation on for-profit text and data mining. 
Um, I don't know if you know anything about this. If you do, I would be interested in hearing your opinions. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Uh, maybe just a quick question for the panel around bias, um, particularly re related to today where we have an announcement around disinformation from the European Commission. Uh, when we get into discussions around illegal and non-illegal content, how does bias fit into this when we start to move further into AI and to address some of these challenges that are uh, societal and also uh, larger than some smaller platforms and smaller SMEs? Thanks. Thank you. And in light of that, perhaps we could add on the anticipated impact of GDPR on AI development, because I think it's a hot question out there as well. And e-privacy. E okay. Yes. Very good. Yes. If you could find a microphone, that would be great. Yes. No, you need to come closer. Uh, I have a question about uh, uh, diversity in the high-tech environment. And who uh, are you, please? Uh, sorry, I'm Aviva Groot from Tilburg University. Um, uh, we heard that um, uh, experts will not disrupt anything, but what I also don't see is much disruption of uh, the power balance in the high-tech environment. And I was wondering um, if you see that as a problem. We talk about bias um, being designed into... Uh, AI systems. I think this is something to look at. Thank you. If you could turn it off. Yeah, it helps our system. Are there any other questions? Yes. If you're in the back, please proactively. Thank you. It's actually to pick up the question on bias. And congratulations, by the way, on organizing this. This is very timely. Could you also uh, introduce yeah, sorry, yourself? My name is Dick Roach. I'm an escapee from politics. Uh, but my question actually is, is, uh, is arises from that, and it arises from this question that was asked here on the issue of bias. The old issue that comes back into play is Juvenal's question, who guards the guardians? Who is actually going to determine what's positive bias and what's negative bias? Uh, I happen to come from a very liberal viewpoint, but somebody said to me recently that all of you liberals are terribly biased. And I kind of made a bit of a shock because basically I wouldn't have seen it like that. But it is a valid question. Who is going to guard the, who guards the guardians? Who will be the gatekeepers? But again, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it relates back to this question of oversight in the yeah. public interest very much and according to which laws, rules, or principles. Um, I see some chairs freeing up, so if people are in the back, they can move forward to sit down. Um, if there's no questions now, then maybe we'll go back to the panel for a first set of answers. Is there anyone who's excited to start? Yes, Niklas? So on the question of bias, I'd like to just say, I think because we can discover bias doesn't mean it's acceptable in any way, to your point earlier. I think one of the things we need to do is to become better at detecting it. As P Professor Floridi pointed out, that is one of the strengths of, of uh, computer, well, computer science generally, that we can find new ways of detecting bias. There's actually a lot of research here that I think uh, could do for, for more investment and, and more collaboration into visualizing data sets so that we can make this bias detectable by humans. Because we need to know if we put the data set into a system that this data set has certain biases so we can discount them or we can discover those biases and not use that data set or correct it. And I think there is, there is some excellent research done on data set visualization that seems to bring out the conclusion that what we need is transparency around data sets and awareness around what the data sets look like. And that's something that we should think hard about how we put into our governance models around artificial intelligence and machine learning. There's, a, there's I think, a, a looking at this from a, from, a, from a corporate perspective, I think that's really important, not only for public authorities, but also for private authorities in order to build trust in these technologies. So uh, I'd, I'd say that. And on the, if I may, on the GDPR, I would just say that I think that we actually are quite optimistic about this, and we believe that, that having a regime that is universal, general, understood, where we can establish compliance will help in terms of establishing uh, good practices around, um, around data protection. Uh, yes, I'll stop there so I don't speak to much. I would like to link the, the topic on ethics and, and, and biases. Uh, one of our members, who is the president of uh, CNRS, so I don't want to take that as my ownership, he mentioned when the French AI strategy was announced three weeks ago, 
where for two hours, three hours, we developed also the ethical part of it. And I'm sorry I'm going to be, again, a little bit angulous, but in order to spark the discussion. And he had this great sentence saying, we have to be careful in Europe that we don't become the world leaders in ethics while other people are doing business. And uh, I know it sounds shocking, but I come back to the point, what is the best recipe uh, to, to make sure, it's what you just said, it's transparency, it's the capacity of experimenting. Um, look at what happened in the gene technology, look at what's happening in the nuclear technology. No rule, or we try at least very hard in some countries, is avoiding people to, 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 to search further. That's a, it's, a, it's an old story. The only thing which can protect us and making sure that we are aware of where people stand right now is to be extremely transparent. There was a huge debate in France about a, a scoring system on attributing spaces to university. And uh, the big topic was not about the system, it's about the fact that you did not know why you had the space and some people did not have. In other countries, and on that one, I also will, will uh, confront uh, an idea that seems to be a, a general accepted idea here. I'm not so sure that the values on the continent and in the US are always the same. There's a system called FICO in the US, which is the, the credit scoring. That is perfectly accepted, which is probably much more difficult to accept in our uh, environment. And nobody is, is, and actually FICO has three out of the five elements which is used in the, in the Chinese social scoring, is how you spend, is if you respected your contracts in the past, and the third thing is if you pay your bills on time. And this is basically allowing people to have access to credit, to housing, and to jobs, and to mobility. I mean, it has a huge social impact. Nobody is questioning that. I'm not so sure we would be accepted. So, so my, my suggestion also to the commission, my, our modest suggestion is, allow massive experimentation capability, because with this experimentation, you will allow people to put relatively openly where they stand at uh, in terms of research and to be relatively transparent where we are at with data sets, with algorithms, et cetera. The worst thing is obviously this, again, I come back and I finish on that, the social scoring in China, where basically you are reduced to a number. And the number is not at all, take, by the way, the number is also, uh, evaluating how good a citizen you were when you posted something on social media. I mean, it's not scary, it's damn scary. Um, and there's one number, and like, uh, since the Chinese are, uh, like to play and game a lot, there is currently an incredibly um, self-censorship on who has the best social score. I mean, uh, we need to experiment, we need to be transparent, and I urge the, the Commission to, to allow people to be uh, as transparent as possible with what they do. That's how you will create the, the trust. But it, I just want to pick up on what you just said about, you know, Europe should not be so good at ethics, you know, while others are doing business or whatever, for the sake of argument. But I think it was you who earlier in the introduction said, um, GDPR was initially seen as very negatively, it's now seen as very positively. My question is, what has changed? In other words, was Europe on the wrong track initially uh, and, uh, you know, did something, uh, an event happen and did it change? Or was there something in our understanding of history on this continent that led us to anticipate some of the problems that are now much more evident to also people in the United States, etc.? So I think you know, if you take that as an example, it could be the case for a normative approach at least without much concern for that this may also have an economic cost, but that it has value in another area. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I absolutely don't miss here. I, I don't want to say we should, like uh, the French president always says, en même temps, that means both. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and we should not have the ethical discussion uh, preventing us to test new things. So we should advance the two things at the, same, at the same pace. The worry is only is that we spend a lot of time defining the norm while the others. The only thing you can reproach to GDPR uh, uh, is that it took I don't know how many years to come up. I understand. So there was a question earlier. Technology is not going to, to decelerate. It's going to accelerate even more. So our democracies need to reinvent, and that's probably the, also the role of the parliament, how do we keep up with the pace of change? Otherwise, uh, you will just be out, outflanked or outpaced by, by what happens. Professor Free. Uh, to, to, uh, to quote my colleague, as uh, he said this morning, I couldn't disagree more. Um, 
politics is not about catching up with technology, it's about determining the direction in which technology goes. And if you like the direction, you can go as fast as you can. In fact, you can't wait to go even faster. The trouble with technology going too fast is because we are driving in the darkness. And therefore, we're not quite sure where we're going, and we're very worried. But if we know where we're going, if we really like, well then, absolutely, you, know, you invest more, you get faster and faster. So remember, this is a, an old story, you know, played onwards. The Kubernetes, which is the pilot of the sea, or the ship in the sea, determines the direction and keeps you know, the ship in the right direction. Well, the winds and the currents and the sea, well, there are something you need to negotiate. And how far and how fast you go, it may not be in your hands, but that you want to go there, well, that's the plan. And that's what politics, capital P, should be about. So I'm not completely sure that we should uh, endorse this narrative, technology goes fast, we need to go faster. That's a bad idea. You never catch the train by running after the train. You are at the railway station earlier. That's how you catch the train. Uh, and that is planning, is normative uh, approach. Now, in terms of uh, uh, ethics, uh, just a comment quickly. There are two ways of doing ethics, before or after. Before is expensive, but after. Man, that is a disaster. It's twice as expensive. It's like the dentist. You can floss and you can brush your teeth and go regularly every six months. If you don't like that, I'll see you afterwards. I'll tell you, it's way more expensive, way more painful. So, other way, earlier or later, ethics is here to come. I would suggest we floss. Great. Uh, I will now ask Stephanie to focus a bit on the whole question about diversity and then come back to Juha uh, for some final thoughts and then there's more room for questions. Yes. Such a nice group. I forget we need a mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, so on diversity, um, for us it's the key against the bias, really, and, and we believe that there is a corporate responsibility to look into that um, and for society as a whole. Um, and the way we look at it is really in everything, and that's why I had it already in my talk track to begin with, it's in everything we do, um, we need to keep that in mind. And I think there, is, there are two ways to look at this. Obviously, companies and the private sector has a duty to take care of that. Obviously, policymakers are there to remind us that we need to take care of that. There is a middle ground. We need to be pushed a little, but I think we also know ourselves that we be benefit for us. For us, there is no discussion around the business value of diversity, equality. That's something we've embraced already. And, and I mean, there are many, many initiatives we can take, but it's only when you take the bull by the, by the horn and that you really implement it. And it's also disruptive for a company to have to think about do we have enough women at the table? Do we have enough diversity? Do we have all the origins, all the nationalities represented? And that's also how we identify bias. So that's something we, we take very seriously and we, we don't shy away from, from the responsibility there. Um, and I think that's really the mindset. We talk from top-down approach, but it's, it's really important here. Like we all have to, to understand what we are doing and really take our own responsibility. And briefly on the TDM, um, but my disclaimer would be I'm no, I'm no copyright expert, um, but there is a clear link between TDM and um, AI, um, and being able to process data and my data is important. So I'm happy to share more details uh, and, and put you in touch with my colleagues, but um, we definitely support a broad um, exception for those who have lawful access to content to mine it. Um, but yeah, happy to take that to a different conversation. Thank you. You are. So um, just on the t TDM, text and data mining, I think there was some, some change to the conditions in the data package that was introduced yesterday. I'm not a copyright expert, either. I'm not the person to answer that question as such, but, uh, but there were some changes made to the exceptions in the data package, uh, uh, which was also introduced yesterday. I wanted to um, link up with what uh, Andre said about experimentation and testing. We do actually recognize, uh, acknowledge the importance of that. We, we put it in the communication as well because um, it's actually important from two different perspectives on the one hand it helps you to develop the technology it gives you the sort of the scope to experiment to try things out but it also gives you the opportunity to try out things particularly when it's combined with, with regulatory sandbox to sort of try out things and and see what would happen if and so on and to see the kind of 
consequences uh, which will then help you draft better legislation if necessary or to see at least what the implications are. So there are two advantages of that and we have something in the pipeline uh, in this respect which is still still obviously being prepared and, and I cannot discuss it now in more detail but it is we, we definitely have ideas in this respect. Great. Thank you very much. Um, are there other questions? I'm surprised. What is going on here? Was the coffee not so good? <laughs> Were the speakers very good because they addressed every point already? Oh, maybe I can... Oh, yeah, go ahead. It's a half-formed question, which is why I've been sitting here quietly, but I'm wanting to... Who are you, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Katrina Peterson. I'm from Trilateral Research in London. And... Um, I'm wanting to push everybody one step further from the question of bias to transparency, which is part and diversity, but diversity defined by who and transparency for who. I think about, um, I, uh, I used to work at a university that had terms called Lent and Michaelmas, and yet my colleagues wouldn't, couldn't hand another hand, uh, handle the fact that my daughter's teacher wore a veil because I thought it was too overt expression of religion. And so there's bias one way, but not another. It was invisible. So how do you make it transparent to things you can't already see? How does diversity support us with that? How do we use AI to help push us past that and um, to, to help us see these normatives? And with that, how do we then help that take us to the next step of care? So not just about responsibility or the ability to contest even, but how does it help us better care for society? So, yeah. Thank you. Yes, let me just look a little bit. Thank you. Let me just look a little bit because I don't want to overlook people who would have a question. But otherwise, I would suggest that with that question, we come back to the last round uh, on the part of the panelists who can also include final thoughts and maybe I'll push a little bit further for an answer on this warnings against fully automated um, killer robot systems I mean are these NGOs really uh, you know so future oriented are they wrong or is there a point there that we cannot be early enough with um, but Professor Floridi go ahead on the um, transparency and care thank you um, I think I hope I'm, I won't be even more controversial than I have been so far by saying that um, uh, usually we, we don't treat transparency as a value. Transparency is a means to an end. Uh, in and of itself, transparency may be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, um, let me give you an example. Uh, when we vote, we want to have zero transparency about whom we voted for. It's 100% opacity for a reason, because it's a way of protecting my freedom to vote for whomever I want, legally, etc. Um, sometimes in terms of uh, uh, um, bidding uh, in a, uh, a public um, uh, offer, etc., we want to have some degree of opacity because I don't need to know who other people are bidding for so that that particular uh, procurement is done, etc. So I can multiply the examples. Uh, so how far we go in total transparency, partial transparency, high degree of what becomes opacity depends on the goal we want to achieve. Now, in this particular case, when it comes to algorithms, there are several goals that we are pursuing. One is purely epistemological. Sorry for the bad word. But, uh, now, we want to know how it works, because only by knowing how it works and how you reach that decision, we can either no, fix it, like it, see whether there was a bias or no. So it's like, what does the box do so that I can control it and fix it, et cetera? But some of the times, we want to be uh, also talking about accountability. So transparency is there to allocate accountability, which then becomes a liability response, et cetera. So the whole talk about transparency as a holy grail, or transparent at all costs, in any place, always, means not having understood what we're talking about. It's a means to an end. There is no such thing as good transparency for its own sake. I believe in the case of the arguments and AI, we need transparency for these several reasons. Accountability, epistemological improvement, can we do better? Is the thing doing the right thing in the right way, etc.? But because we have those goals. Thank you very much. As I think, I mean, I'd like to address the question of killer robots. I think there is a, there's a lot to be said about, not necessarily the killer robots, but about safety. And I think there's a safety issue around artificial intelligence. And it's, it's interesting, if you go back to French philosopher Simone Weil, uh, who, who 
wrote a book called Need for Roots after the Second World War in order to re-examine the basis for ethics. Uh, she, she spoke a lot about automation, actually. She had one specific chapter about automation. She set out three criteria for automation that I think apply to the design of artificial intelligence as well. The first one was very simple. It was, uh, it should be safe. It should actually fulfill basic safety requirements. That, was, that is something that the industry is now working on through something called the Partnership for AI, which is a series of industry companies working together, and, and safety is a core thing. Her second criteria was that it should be general so that anyone can learn it. It should be open. And this is a part of the ethos of the artificial intelligence community. I've published open, there's open source tools. We provide several of them. There's a lot of open learning opportunities for AI. Nothing should be closed. And so we're following that second design criterion as well. And then her third criterion was interesting. She said it should always require a human. It should always be based on complementarity. And those three criteria that I lays out, I think we find a lot of, a lot of the... Um, uh, support for how we think about uh, AI as well. And I think your question about killer robots is not a, and the NGO's concern is not a misplaced one, but I think the way to think about it or to operationalize it is to think about it as safety. And look at the technology and see that it fulfills basic safety requirements and that it's used in ways that are safe. In the interest of time, I'll do it very short. I think this, this discussion on, uh, on killer robot is is not new because I remind everybody that landmines are already killer robots for decades so far. There's no human responsibility, only the one who is lying it. And uh, I go back, and on that one I concur uh, uh, completely. I think today the, the, the fact that the ethical topic has, has reached such a height and the anxiety about new technology is, is also used politically uh, prevents us to be extremely transparent. I mean, one of our members, again, Stuart Russell, has been the one who made this movie, I can only encourage you to look at it, um, on, on killer mini drones. Uh, they already exist. It, I mean, where you basically, the movie shows that somebody's like throwing in the air a couple of mini drones that uh, then find themselves the target and, 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 and can kill. So yes, the situation exists. Those who say we are not at this stage technologically are, are, are plainly lying. The, the, the question here is are we uh, encouraging I would say the, the, the innovation forces to balance themselves in order that we're not helpless or are we, are we leaving basically those who are not applying the same rules. I, I just want to remain, in the defense sector, the, the US has called that the third offset strategy. They have considered that technology advancement has allowed um, very small states or guerrilla organization actually to, thanks to technology, to put themselves at par with much larger states, with much larger budgets. So technology has a, um, how do you call that, nivelling aspects. So if, if we put, and I know this is not the Convention of Wisdom, too much constraints on, I would say, those who want to apply technology for the good, and I come back to my missions, I think it should be in the framework of missions, the risk is that you leave a completely gray zone, and today the world, I'm sorry to say, is more driven by countries and organizations who are not applying these ethical standards. They are on the rise. We are on the descending path. Uh, you can call it the, the maybe Europe, maybe the US. But you mentioned Putin before, China. But you see a lot of, uh, I mean, I remind everybody a uh, last point, which is a bit scary. The Chinese have built massive data centers, uh, especially designed to handle a massive amounts of data in the environment of Beijing, because they are now exporting their social scoring system to third countries. That becomes an export good. And you can imagine that a couple of countries are very interested, and even some in, in, in our European neighborhood, to apply that to the same, to, in the same population. So should we put too much constraint? I mean, it's, a, it's an eternal dilemma. Um, I think we need to be transparent to know what is happening in, with the technology, but to allow the experimentation. And I, I, I thank you, Jua, to, 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 to put that in your, in your, uh, in your framework. So, um, to what extent the concerns and fears are justified, um, this is the reason exactly why, as part of this strategy, we want to demystify this technology. Uh, we think that it's important to uh, monitor its progress, to see what these systems can do, 
uh, and what they cannot do. Um, so to, to give a realistic picture uh, so that we can then take, uh, or political decision makers can take informed decisions about those questions that they need to decide on. So this uh, idea of, of uh, monitoring progress and showcasing as well, to show what these systems can do to help people, uh, we see this as a, as a means of, of uh, increasing transparency about, uh, uh, and, and, and about these systems and, and adding concrete uh, information to the discussion and debate of what they can, they can do. And, and on that basis, uh, we can then perhaps draw conclusions which are more helpful and, and meaningful. So certainly from, from that perspective, this, this, and, and we see this, I see this uh, we, in our activities when we meet people, when we go to events, uh, certainly there are misconceptions about what, what technology can do and what it cannot do. And certainly whenever we add the dimension of physical instantiation, platforms, robots, things, get much, things do get much harder. Um, it's very hard to, of course, predict how rapid progress will be. Uh, and what we have, what we'll have in 10 years, for example, and I wouldn't want to enter into that game. Um, but I think this is important to to have a realistic picture of what can be done, and and we aim to take, uh, we plan to take uh, measures in this respect. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, I. So I agree to your point. I think there, I still believe we need to demystify. And, and the more I listen to this conversation, I, I still see the human um, behind the technology. We're talking about algorithm and how the decision is made. Oh well, yes, it's still the human deciding how the decision is made. And we can also decide to keep it that way. I think in terms of transparency, we should always be able to say how the decision is made. We can include controls in the process. And that's the way for us to keep our hands uh, on the technology. Um, talking about bias, of course, we, we are pushed to enter a new dimension and think about what it is and how do we define it. But the more I think about it, we already have laws and rules in the framework around discrimination. And I, I see no different worlds there. We just need to adapt what is discrimination in, 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 um, in a given context to another one. And I think we just should look at this as a whole and, and, and not reinvent it completely, but really see we already define discrimination. How does that apply to AI? And how do we look at that? And how does that link to bias? But I see, I see a clear link and a continuity more than a here, no disruption in that sense. Um, and maybe in terms of when we need to define, just going back to Nicolas' point about the multi-stakeholder approach, I think it's just, we need those conversations. We all need to run, get around the table and discuss at the different perspective to look at the opportunities, the challenges, and, and what it is that we really want to achieve. Thank you. Well, this afternoon was certainly one attempt at bringing different people around the table, and I intend to do uh, more of that. Uh, what I take away, besides the uh, uh, opportunity to talk about the EU strategy, and I'm sure it won't be the last time that we'll discuss it, um, is really, um, you know, the, the difference between where the innovations stand today uh, versus the myths. And I think this notion of demystifying by making tangible what can already happen is very helpful. Uh, this, this notion that application of AI is key to identify context and, and how that informs our possible um, need to act. Um, that is one of the key takeaways for me, uh, certainly. But I guess no matter the application, I hear a lot of people talking about the essential importance of ethics. And still, for me, not all questions about whose ethics, whose rules, whose values, who, whose governance are answered, especially in technology that proliferates globally more and more, uh, where there is a real competition for these very systems of values that govern our lives, including technology. Uh, that's something that I think we need to, to look at and not forget that there are parts of the world where ethics are, are not the priority uh, or even an aspiration. So for me, as at least uh, being a lawmaker in democracy, questions of oversight, uh, looking at how the rule of law can apply in this rapidly changing environment is still very, very important. And uh, in that sense, we keep learning too, not just as machines, but as people. And um, uh, I really would like to end with the quote that is perhaps even more remarkable being shared by someone from Google, but it's one that I will remember, is that uh, all use of technology is the exercise of power. 
and with that also uh, should come responsibilities, I believe. So thank you very much. Thank all the panelists, especially for sharing their time and their thoughts. I've learned a lot and I hope you have too. Thank you.